I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room, where, as most of you watching know, we will be discussing advancements in small cell lung cancer, very important topic that is near and dear to the hearts of the GoTo Foundation. Um, I'm Danielle Hicks, Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation. Tonight, we're going to be talking about small cell lung cancer um, and advancements that um, have been made and are continuing to be made in this space. People diagnosed with small cell lung cancer have long been awaiting their turn for new treatment options, similar to the explosion that has happened over the last you know, decade and a half in non-small cell lung cancer. And tonight we're going to kick off um, uh, what is what and what is happening in this space. We'll also uh, be talking about all the work that GoTo is 100% committed to in developing community awareness, research, and funding uh, around specifically non-small cell lung cancer and uh, those who are living with it. Tonight we have uh, Dr. Charles Rudin, who's a MD, PhD. He's Chief of Thoracic Oncology Service, Co-Director at Drunken Miller Center for Lung Cancer Research. Sylvia Hassenfeld, Chair in Lung Cancer Research at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And uh, we are very thrilled to have our very own Jennifer King, PhD, our Chief Scientific Officer from GoTo Lung Cancer Foundation, join us tonight as well. Thank you both for being here tonight. With that, I think I want to jump right in because we've got a lot of stuff to discuss um, in a fairly short amount of time. But I think I want to start, Dr. Rudin, with you and ask you, you know, in particular, what is small cell um, lung cancer? How does it differ from non-small cell lung cancer? And why historically has it been considered sort of harder to treat? Um, that's a great question. So small cell lung cancer, we think, originates in a different cell within the lung, in a neuroendocrine cell. It's a sort of rare cell within the lung. And non-small cell lung cancer typically occurs in the cells that line the air sacs of the, of the lung. So different cell of origin and different mutations. Um, small cell lung cancer, in contrast to non-small cell lung cancer, is, is almost always associated with tobacco exposure. So 98% of the patients are current or former smokers. Um, so it's got a very strong association uh, there. Why is it difficult to treat? I think it's difficult to treat in part because it's a tumor type where the, where the genetics are one of, of loss of genes rather than gain of mutations. You know, the non-small cell mutations that we all talk about that are the driver mutations for which we have targeted therapies those don't exist in small cell lung cancer. We don't have those sort of driver, you know, positive alterations. We have negative alterations. Genes are lost and it's very hard to target a loss. So for a lot of years, it was really hard to think about how to best make advances in molecular targeting of small cell lung cancer the way we have for non-small cell. I think that is changing today, and I hope we get to talk about that tonight, but, but that has been a limitation in the field. So we know that it's different from, from its very core, right, um, mm -hmm. based on what you've said. How is the staging also maybe different when, it, when we're talking about a, a small cell patient versus a non-small cell? Folks might be more used to hearing stage one, two, three, or four with some A's and B's, you know, and potentially right. C's <laughs> pushed in there a little bit. How, how is this different? So formally, we use the same staging system for small cell and non-small cell, but in practice, there's it's a simpler staging system. There's really two. There's limited stage and extensive stage. And limited stage means the cancer is confined to one lung and one side of the chest so that it can be encompassed within a radiation port. Uh, for a radiation oncologist to treat. If it has spread beyond that, if it's gone to the other lung or if it's gone elsewhere in the body, which unfortunately it frequently does, that's called extensive stage. 
The reason those stages are so different is they're treated very differently. So I, so before we get into the treatments and talking about the spread or the potential metastases for um, small cell lung cancer, um, we know that small cell tends to, I, I was going to say like the brain, but that sounds inappropriate, but it tends to spread to the brain. Is that specific to small cell? Is it with within all types of lung cancer? Can you can you talk about that a little bit? It, it is within all types of lung cancer, but you're right. Small cell lung cancer has a predilection for going to the brain. And I think that's partly because it is, I told you the cell of origin is a neuroendocrine cell. That cell actually has neuronal features. It kind of looks like a nerve and it expresses some of the same genes. And some really neat emerging work right now uh, from some of my colleagues, including uh, Julian Saj at Stanford, has shown that when lung cancer, when small cell goes to the brain, it actually talks to all the brain cells too. It's, it's, uh, there's interesting biology there. But you're right, it, it, different cancers have different tropisms, we call them, for different organs. And small cell has a strong tropism, a small tendon, a strong tendency to go to the brain. To Dr. Rune's point, you you it is officially stage one through four, but when we start talking to people in practice, no one is using that. So while we ended up kind of not entirely dropping it from all the patient and caregiver educational materials, we at one point reverted from using it and went back to much more clearly and plainly making simple materials that say limited stage, extensive stage, because that's that's really how people think about it and how it's treated in reality. Um, so I, I completely agree that that's, that's really the way most people still talk about it. And, and we made a thoughtful decision to keep our materials um, phrased in that way. Yeah, and I know we're going to jump into to this a little bit later, but there is a, a, a unique set of needs for our small cell community in that, you know, quite often, even though most patients are, and caregivers are advised not to, they, they defer to Dr. Google. And you cannot type in small cell lung cancer without getting a laundry list of information about non-small cell lung cancer yeah. because the, the words are in there, right? So... Um, it is a challenge for patients to get accurate information and, and to become really confused about the differences. And, and like I said, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about what GoTo is trying to do to to battle that. So, Dr. Rudin, are are the symptoms of small cell lung cancer different than they are for non small cell lung cancer? Do they come on earlier, later, the same amount of time, or or do they pretty much mirror one another as far as that goes? I would say it's very similar in terms of the spectrum of symptoms. You know, sometimes it's pretty silent until it's advanced, but the, the symptoms that often occur would be cough, shortness of breath, sometimes coughing up blood, chest pain, um, that kind of thing. Is usually, if we see anything, that's part of the onset. Weight loss, more general symptoms are sometimes part of the picture. But I wouldn't say there's anything that's super specific for small cell in terms of the symptoms. Okay. I would say the pace is very different in that it's a very rapidly progressive, a, you know, rapidly growing cancer, also very rapidly responsive to chemo, fortunately, but rapidly growing. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into some of the treatment options. And I know, you know, for a better part of half a century, those treatment op options didn't necessarily change, right? And now we are going to jump into some of the advancements that are being made, and some of the the, the um, even even further treatment options that are that are in clinical trials right now. But today, let's start with limited stage. How do we typically first line treat a limited stage small cell lung cancer? What what might that flow look like? Sure. So, Danielle, when, when we talk about limited stage, again, that means it's encompassed within a radiation field. So part of the first line treatment there is radiation. And the goal of the radiation is, is to kill tumor where you aim the beam, you know, and it's very effective where you do aim the beam. This is a very radiosensitive cancer, actually. It almost always shrinks very nicely. The chemotherapy is given along with radiation. And, and that has really two roles. One is it enhances the radiation. It actually makes the radiation work 
better. It's what we call a, a radio sensitizer. Um, and it treats the rest of the body because even in limited stage, there's a risk that there's microscopic disease that has spread, not detectable on scans, but there might be individual cells that have floated off and are stuck in the liver or the brain or the bone. And so the chemotherapy treats micrometastatic disease to try to eliminate that. So combination chemo and radiation for limited is surgery ever used for small cell lung cancer? That's a question we get all the time. Surgery is sometimes used. Yeah, and we advocate for surgery in very early stage cancer, small cell lung cancer. Occasionally we have a, a solitary pulmonary nodule that's resected and it's small cell. Great. Uh, we'd rather have it out in the body and in a bucket than in the chest, you know. Um, and if we find it early and it's, you know, with no negative disease, just an isolated pulmonary nodule, our, our approach to that is to take it out um, because the best local therapy is surgery. Unfortunately, most of the cases are not surgically resectable. It's maybe 3% or something like that. But, but if we can, we should take it out. And in those cases where we do take it out, we don't give any radiation because the local disease is, is gone, but we do give chemotherapy. And that's really important because it reduces the chance of, of recurrence because you're treating the microscopic disease that might spread. So Dr. Rudin, we, we talked a little bit about limited stage in the treatment. Is the same type of treatment um, given to those with extensive stage small cell lung cancer? Um, actually, extensive stage is one of the places where we've seen a little bit of change in the, in the standard of care for small cell lung cancer. The standard of care has always been chemotherapy and a particular combination of chemotherapy, platinum with an atopicide drug. The change that occurred just in the last couple of years is the addition, um, and um, uh, Jennifer brought this up, of immunotherapy which has really changed our first line therapy. So now it's chemo immunotherapy um, with one of the PDL1 drugs um, added in. Unfortunately, the majority of patients don't respond to immunotherapy, but some do, and it can be transformative for those patients. So we do have patients who are long-term disease-free survivors, even with extensive stage disease because of the advent of immunotherapy. So before I jump into a lot of questions about some of these new first-line therapies, i.e. immunotherapy, I want to step back a little bit. We talked some about how small cell lung cancer in particular tends to uh, find its way to the brain. And I think historically and maybe even currently, decisions are made around prophylactic cranial irradiation. And for those folks watching, that means radiation specifically to the brain, a whole brain type radiation, um, even if we don't necessarily see a cancer there. Is that still used? If it is, can we talk about maybe why? It is, and it's something that I would say involves a significant conversation with the patient because there's pluses and minuses to, to doing that. For limited stage disease, where about 25% of patients are cured with chemo radiotherapy, we do recommend in most patients um, low dose whole brain radiation. That sounds very scary, but most of the brain cells are actually very radio resistant, they're not dividing, whereas the cancer cells are rapidly dividing and are very radio sensitive. So that treatment really is designed to eradicate microscopic residual disease that might be in the brain. The brain doesn't get chemotherapy to the same extent as the rest of the body, so it can be what we call a sanctuary site where the cancer can kind of hide out. Um, so that's why radiation is offered in that context. I would say, as I say, it's a conversation because there's toxicity in terms of short-term memory loss in terms of fatigue uh, and, you know, sometimes real neurocognitive deficits that occur. So I, I, um, I don't refer people for that lightly, um, but in a case where we're really pushing for cure and, and we think there's a good chance of it, we will 
um, often opt for that. For extensive stage disease, it used to be part of the standard of care, and now I think it's increasingly not. There was a trial in, Je in Japan that randomized patients who had gotten MRIs after chemotherapy, uh, and those patients who had a negative MRI were randomized to get or not get prophylactic cranial radiation. And, and in fact, the group that got the radiation did worse. Um, so that data has really swayed in my practice away from referring those patients for prophylactic cranial radiation. So when we're doing this prophylactic cranial irradiation or PCI, um, and it is, you said, you know, low dose, um, is there an option for, um, you know, you talked about some of the concerns around cognitive abilities and whatnot. Is there an option in this space for a hippocampal sort of sparing low dose yes. whole brain radiation therapy? Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so the hippocampus is the part of the brain, deep in the brain, that's really your memory center. Um, and um, we can now apply radiation very specifically to avoid areas that are of particular concern. And so there is an approach being looked at called hippocampal sparing, where the hippocampus specifically doesn't get much radiation. I wouldn't say it gets none, but doesn't get much. Um, that may preserve memory function. It runs the risk of not treating all the disease. So is it better? Is it worse? We actually don't know, and, but it's an option. And it's something that's being looked at now in clinical trials. And um, patient reported outcomes are gonna be critical in sort of determining whether that's better or worse, because we obviously want to preserve memory, we want to preserve quality of life. We also want to cure people. So um, it's a balance and, and it's hard to know right now uh, whether that's a better approach or not. But again, I think it's something to talk to your radiation oncologist about and to really weigh the risks and benefits. And for many, it's really a personal decision what side of that you want to fall on to, you know, you have options. I think the patient is very much in the driver's seat on this. And I think that's really an important point to stress because one, one of the things we unfortunately see in this community a lot or have historically, I think is not a lot of empowerment around treatment decisions. You know, we, we get a lot of, uh, comments about, well, I have the bad cancer and I, I don't have these options and I don't have um, as many opportunities as, you know, someone with other types of cancer. We really want to make sure people are having these conversations, are asking questions. Is this brain radiation right for me? Why or why not? What are the risks and benefits? What should I be considering? And making sure that, you know, anyone who watches this tonight is really taking that away that you should be asking the questions, you should be helping to make the final decisions with your treatment team um, and having that true, what we call a shared decision-making conversation, because it can be really important for some of these areas where sadly we don't know the right answer. You know, we're doing clinical trials to try to get there, but we don't, always know what the right answer is and sometimes it's very much up to your personal decisions and personal choices um, amen so, so absolutely everyone yeah. to have those conversations absolutely absolutely and i think this is one area where you can choose no brain radiation whole brain radiation or hippocampal sparing and those are three options and and really you know if a radiation oncologist comes and just says this is what we do here you go uh, you gotta, you gotta push back a little bit because because there are risks and benefits to all three, and and so we really make sure people are informed, and then let them be involved in sort of sorting out what's right for them. Yeah, I could not agree with both of you more. That conversation between healthcare provider and patient is so incredibly important. Unfortunately, we know all too well that it doesn't happen as often as we would like it to. Um, we also understand and respect that, you know, these docs are, are, are busy, but 
this is we, I think we started this meeting tonight talking about educated and empowered patients. So if you come in knowing the right questions to ask your physician, it makes that conversation so much so 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 much easier. Um, and I, we're going to get a, a little bit into clinical tri trials. And Dr. Rin, you touched on patient reported outcomes, and I know Jennifer's going to get into that a, in a little bit um, as well. Um, so one of the other things before we again jump into some of this immunotherapy stuff that we talked about is small cell lung cancer and its tendency to have this really incredible response to its first line treatment, which could lend itself to, to sort of this false sort of sense or idea about what's happening for the patient themselves. Can you talk a little bit about that initial response and why it may or may not last? Yeah, it's one of the one of the real frustrations about this disease is is um, that it doesn't last. We often see really dramatic responses. These tumors are very sensitive to chemotherapy when the patient initially presents, so the response rates are very high and they're very dramatic. So they're kind of what we call Lazarus responses, you know, rise from the grave kind of responses. Unfortunately, it's a disease that has a lot of what we call heterogeneity. That means there are different mutations in different parts of the tumor, and, and it, can, it can mutate along the way. And it is a tumor that goes from highly chemosensitive to uh, recurrent pretty quickly, um, unfortunately. And when it recurs, it can be tougher to treat. The, the, the drugs work typically less well, at least the first-line drugs work less well. Yeah, I think it's just important to note because, I, I, again, I don't think that's part of a conversation a lot of people living with small cell lung cancer get to have with, with their healthcare providers. However, with that being said, now I want to jump into the um, but and, I guess, piece of this. And we touched a little bit on the role of immunotherapy um, in small cell, which is fairly new um, treatment to, to this space. Can you talk about how immunotherapy works? and what role it's playing in treating small cell lung cancer patients. Sure. The immunotherapy drugs that we're using for small cell are the same kind of drugs that we use for non-small cell or for melanoma or for kidney cancer or for lots of other cancers now. Essentially what these drugs do is take the brakes off the immune system. So the immune system, of course, reacts to infection or to problems in the body strongly and then kind of attenuates itself, it turns itself off. These drugs sort of prevent the immune system from turning off. So it allows the cancer, it allows the immune system to recognize the cancer and continue to respond to the cancer. When it works, you can get dramatic responses that are long lasting because the immune system is adaptable. It's biology, not chemistry. So it, it adapts and changes and continue to fight. So um, that's why immunotherapy has these sort of durable responses that we don't often see with chemotherapy. So it's part of the standard paradigm now for small cell, just like for non-small cell. Is there a diagnostic test or a way of determining who it might work for and who it might not? No. And, you know, some of the biomarkers that we use for non-small cell, like EGL1 staining on the tumor, are not predictive for small cell. Almost all the small cells have a high tumor mutation burden, another biomarker that we use in non-small cell. So we don't know. Um, and because we don't know, I would offer immunotherapy to almost everybody with small cell lung cancer because I don't want them to not have the opportunity to be in the group that has that durable benefit. Even if that group is only 10% of the patients, that's 10% of patients that may have changed their outcome dramatically. So every patient I see, I want to be in that 10%, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I absolutely. Think that's a really important point and something that's, it's hard, but it's different from where we were only, you know, a year or two ago. And we saw that initially in non-small cell too. We, there was this group of people that was really responding well for a very long period of time. And initially there was very little known about who they are. I think that's kind of where we are in small cell as well as in many other types of cancer where immunotherapy is being used. We do not always know who those responders are gonna be, but 
I know, I know personally, there are many of us know personally people with small cell lung cancer who have had these amazing immunotherapy responses and are many years out now um, and, and didn't know they were going to be that person. But to your point, you know, there is an appreciable difference, even though we don't know yet who it works for, when it works, it can be pretty amazing. And so it gives me a lot of hope that as the science evolves, as we learn more about the biology, hopefully we can figure out who those people are and target it much better. But there yeah. is clearly something there that for some people it's working very, very well. Yeah, and I think that gives us a really important foothold because, you know, if it works in some of the patients, then we need to think about the other 90% and how do we get them to respond to immunotherapy and what are some of the strategies that might prime the immune system to give that benefit to a larger fraction of the patients. And that to me is really what the area that's the hottest right now in small cell research is, is how do we stimulate the immune system for the patients who are not primary responders to immunotherapy? I'm not interested in taking away immunotherapy from that group. I'm interested in figuring out how to make it work better. So um, there are very rare people who are not eligible for receiving a checkpoint inhibitor and immunotherapy. And, but, but for the large majority, I think, uh, I would offer them the, the, the opportunity to benefit. You know, I think um, our industry partners, as well as all of the people out there who participated in the trials to get these drugs approved for small cell lung cancer, but there tends to be because of that amazing direct to consumer sort of marketing that's happening, everybody walking in the door, just assuming that immunotherapy, whether small cell or non small cell for that matter, is this sort of miracle sort of drug. And I think there's still a lot to both of your points to be learned about um, the, the who and the why this drug might work best for. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about clinical trials. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening in the research realm for small cell lung cancer um, right now? And, and specifically, we get a lot of questions you know, around are there any emerging biomarkers um, or new therapies um, in that sort of targeted space? Yeah, so first of all, absolutely our patients are our partners in, in making discoveries in this space, and they're absolutely essential uh, and equal partner and, and part of the team, and the, frankly, the part of the team that takes the hardest hit, of course, in terms of making progress against this disease. Uh, we can't do it without them. And I, you spoke initially about the non-small cell community that really didn't exist and then does exist now. And that's largely because of survivors. And now with immunotherapy, we are getting small cell survivors. And there is a building community of survivors that is changing research impetus in this disease. Um, back in 2012, I was invited by the NCI director to write a white paper to Congress to sort of define what are the what are the problems that are that are preventing us from making progress against small cell lung cancer. This was part of the Recalcitrant Cancer Act that was focused on small cell and pancreatic cancer, two really deadly cancers in in nineteen in, in two thousand twelve. We wrote this white paper to Congress and, and Congress actually set aside funds to the NCI specifically for small cell. So since the, the last five years or so, we've had a small cell consortium of labs funded all over the country that are working on small cell. And, and this is really bringing forward new biology, new understanding of the disease. It is a preclinical group. That is, it's laboratory based, it's discovery based, it's defining new targets. But it's defining a lot of new targets that are now reaching into the clinic uh, and informing the current generation of clinical trials. So this is really a, an area where there's, I, I think, a tremendous amount of hope today for real change because we have a much better understanding of the relevant biology behind this tumor type. And that's led us to new approaches that are being explored right now in the clinic. Uh, for patients with small cell lung cancer. 
it remains, unfortunately, a very deadly tumor. But I think it's one where we're beginning to see change. And that change tends to snowball, as we've seen in non-small cell uh, and in other tumor types. So when we're talking about clinical trials, when's a good time for me to start exploring clinical trials? And sometimes is a first-line treatment a best treatment option maybe for a small cell lung cancer patient? Well, you know, I'm biased. I'm, I'm a trialist. I, I, I went into this business not to give the standard of care, but to, but to push the envelope. I would turn the question around and say, when's not the right time to think of a clinical trial? I, I think for this disease, Clinical trials represent the cutting edge of oncology. They represent what the current thinking is about this disease. And, and that's where you want to position yourself, in my opinion. Again, I'm biased, but I really do think um, participation in clinical trials first line makes tremendous sense to me in a, in a potentially lethal disease. Um, and, and these trials are designed in such a way that patients uh, are treated to ensure that they're at least getting a standard of care uh, uh, and perhaps are getting an investigational therapy on top of that. Of course, that therapy, the investigational therapy, may have toxicities and many of them fail, you know. So th there may be a, a real downside to having gotten an experimental therapy. But I, I do think getting the opportunity to participate in, in those trials and taking that chance to me makes makes good sense. And it, that's true in essentially all lines of therapy. And I'm also clearly pro-clinical trial, but I do think having those conversations up front is really important too. You may or may not choose to do that first line clinical trial but as we've talked about, for many people, unfortunately, recurrence can be pretty quick. So even if you don't make the choice to go on a trial up front, if you want to try the standard chemotherapy, immunotherapy option, and you and your treatment team decide that's the right spot for you right then, having that clinical trial conversation and saying, well, what would be next if I recur? Are there trials here? Should I be looking at trials elsewhere? What are the options? is a great place to start that conversation. So we, we really encourage people to start the conversations about trials as early as possible. Doesn't mean you have to go in it. Even if you enroll in a clinical trial, you are allowed to back out any time. You, you have a lot of choice, but finding out about what's out there um, and, and to the point that was just made, that's really the edge of the best science at the moment, it's really important. And we do encourage everybody to ask and have the conversation. Yeah, I, you know, patients are free agents and they can decide for themselves, but I think getting the information is, is really helpful. And we, of course, there are patients who we recommend the standard of care, but I think having an informed choice is always a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And I think kind of breaking down some of the stigmas, um, you know, around what it, what it means to participate in a clinical trial are, are, are so important too, um, where people are fearful that they're getting zero treatment at all if they're not getting the trial drug, right? And, and, and not most... Not that kind of trial anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I, th but I still think problem. that that's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge misunderstanding in the, in the, oncology you know population as a general rule people don't really understand that they think about it as their you know their grandfather or their great grandfather's type of clinical trial um, experience and you know the same thing can go with with chemotherapy which is a whole other uh, living room so before we jump into Jennifer I do want we got a couple of questions that I'm going to combine into one because they're very specific and it's around transformation um, from non small cell lung cancer to small cell lung cancer particularly as it pertains to a non-small cell lung cancer patient treated with chemotherapy and then one treated with EGFR TKI. Is there a difference in those two? And can you talk a little bit about the transformations? Yeah, this is an area that we're really interested in in our group and, and really actively studying. We see this uh, in EGFR, we see it in ALK, we see it in KRAS treated with KRAS inhibitors, we see it in any targeted therapy group. So this can happen and it can happen on chemotherapy. It can even happen out of the gate. We see mixed 
non-small cell and small cell at diagnosis. And so these tumors are what we call plastic. That means they can change their shape. They're shape shifters. Um, it can start as a non-small cell and disrupt those key genes that are induced in small cell. And, and then it can look like a small cell, behave like a small cell, and we treat them like a small cell. And those are what we call transformed small cell lung cancer. Honestly, we don't know how to best treat those. We treat them like small cell because we don't know any better. Um, but I think we got to figure out more about the biology of that process and see, are there ways to constrain plasticity and prevent histologic transformation and prevent this sort of event from happening? Because it's a bad thing when, when an EGFR mutant patient transforms into small cell. Great. And then final, final uh, sort of clinically related question is, how can you tell if memory issues might be due to brain radiation versus typical aging related memory loss? Is there a difference? Yes and yes. I, you know, it can be both, of course. And, and um, you know, the median age of our patient population is 70. So many of them are older than 70. And, and that is a group that starts to have age-related decrement in, in short-term memory. And, and there are other diseases, of course, that occur in the same population that are associated with, with uh, memory loss. So uh, it can be very difficult to tease it apart. I think the best hunch we have is really based on temporal proximity. That is, if you radiated in the next month or the next six months, the patient's really declining, you know, sort of stepwise uh, in terms of function. I think that's probably our fault, or at least partly our fault. Uh, but these are often multifactorial. And I think that's a that's a perfect segue into some of the things I want um, Jennifer to talk about. You know, GoTo Foundation um, began an, an initiative about a year, a little over a year ago, specific to the small cell lung cancer population. Um, and and I would love for her to talk a little bit about the goals of this initiative and the hope um, that we're working to generate. Um, and, you know, to be able to come your hub for all things small cell lung cancer so you don't have to weed through all of the other stuff on, on Google or in other areas. So, Jennifer, would you mind talking a little bit about what the goals are and some of the progress that uh, the GoTo team has made so far this year? Sure, absolutely. So, so as we sort of referred to earlier, the, the goal of the Small Cell Initiative was to engage, educate, support, and empower people living with small cell lung cancer as well as their caregivers and to really start to build that more supported and hopeful community. So we're we're really thinking of it as a framework where we're layering on different pieces. We started very much listening. Um, we went out to social workers and nurse navigators and said, you know, what do the people in your community need? What how can we best be of help? Um, and that was a great exercise. It led to, you know, one of the first things that was identified were those really simple education pieces that could be used at the point of diagnosis. So that's something we've created now. You can find those pieces at gotofoundation.org backslash small cell. Um, and it's just a one pager front and back for limited and one for extensive. That's, these are the things you need to know right now at the point of diagnosis. Um, we learned so much from listening to those providers that we've actually expanded that project. And we're now doing a full, what's called a qualitative research study or an interview study in partnership with Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where we're interviewing nurses, nurse navigators, social workers across the country to understand what's working and what's not working with patients and caregivers in that community, where the gaps are, what the needs are. And um, we are in the midst of the interviews and it's research that we hope we'll be putting out in the coming year so that everybody can benefit of it from it. It's really exciting. Um, at the same time, we are listening to patients and caregivers themselves. There's also a survey you can find on that web page and people who call the helpline we're talking to, to really understand what's missing, what are the needs. As we begin to provide that education, we are also providing support programs. So that's really the next level. We don't want to provide education without support. 
We are doing all sorts of things. The living room, the we have peer-to-peer -peer support networks with phone buddies where you can be matched with someone. I mentioned our helpline. We have the treatment and trial navigation team with Lung Match. We're really trying to be there for the patient community as much as we can and provide as many mechanisms of support as we can over time. All of this is actually already starting to pay off, even though this is a relatively new initiative. Over the past six months, our calls to the helpline from people with small cell have doubled. So we're seeing more people reaching out, more people looking for education, and then we're able to connect more of those survivors in hopes of really building out community in the same way so that people can learn from each other as well as learning from us. And then the last piece is kind of what we've been alluding to a lot tonight in different ways, which is as we start to educate and support and strengthen the small cell community, we want to make sure we're also learning again. We sort of started with learning and ending with learning, but we need to learn about the patient reported outcomes that we've heard about earlier. You know, there are big questions in oncology of small cell about what is best for a patient that can only be answered by someone who's being treated. So can we get people to join the lung cancer registry and give us that patient reported outcome data that's so needed so that we can shape care properly? As we build out the community, can we help with accrual to clinical trials? Some of these clinical trials are gonna be so important for approving the next generation of drugs can we do more research to really benefit the community and help all the efforts that Dr. Rudin talked about, about how we're really bolstering and NCI and others are supporting research in this area. So we view this as such an important initiative that starts with listening, ends with really learning from everybody, but is a continuous cycle of how we can provide education and support. So I encourage everyone to go to that page, go to foundation.org slash small cell, reach out to our team as needed. They are here to help. Um, and we are constantly trying to add on and improve what we're giving out as resources. There's based on feedback, there's new education materials in the works too, I'll say sort of a teaser for the coming months. One really specific to side effects from small cell treatment one looking around brain metastases and education around what you do in the case of having those metastases to the brain. Um, so a lot of new pieces coming that are all based on patient caregiver needs, as well as the needs we're hearing from the on the ground providers. Jennifer, thank you. I think that was a, a fantastic overview. And again, each, you know, we could, we could, all continue this conversation for another hour plus 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 right because i think there's so much to discuss here so many ex exciting things happening so much hope being generated and created but if i if i can reiterate anything you know around this is that one of the things jennifer just said is and, and dr rudin alluded to it earlier is we want to hear from you go to foundation doesn't pretend to know exactly what it is our small cell lung cancer community needs um, um, but um, we're, we're counting on you to kind of help us to, to fill that gap that has been there for so long for, for this community. I want to um, remind everyone, if you would like regular updates um, on this program in the Lung Cancer Living Room specifically, as well as other information on other GoTo Foundation uh, programs and services, such as um, our small cell uh, community build out, please consider joining our patient and caregiver community. Um, and I think Rocky's gonna put that up on the screen, but it's at gotofoundation.org backslash living room. Uh, the plan is to use that as a place to really be able to target um, uh, the info or to be able to gather the information that you guys want to hear about and target those communications directly to you. Um, a huge thank you to Dr. Rudin and Dr. King for joining us tonight. To all of you watching live, um, or those of you who will come back and watch post live, Peninsula Television for working the back end of this so seamlessly for us. Um, to the entire GoTo team um, as well for all the time, effort, energy and passion that they put into working together um, uh, with all of us and all of you um, to combat this disease. 
Uh, I would be remiss in not thanking our supporters, specifically Amgen, AstraZeneca, AMD, Serrano, G1 Therapeutics, Genentech, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Merck, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Senkyo, Lilly, Foundation Medicine, Novartis, Regeneron Sanofi, and Takeda. Thank you so much for all of your support and, and um, continuing to enable us to bring this important um, information out to our community. Um, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will uh, see you in the new year, if not before. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see.